Good morning, everyone. Hope you guys are doing well. You've endured another week of extreme heat. Uh, I was out in the yard yesterday cutting branches and dragging them away, and I am praying for anything but summer right now. I would like fall. I would take like pre-fall. I would take winter, whatever. All right, my, my air conditioning bill would thank me as well. That'd be nice. Uh, but anyway, glad you're here this morning, and uh, we'll keep it nice and cool in here for you this morning while we, do, while we have some preaching, all right? Um, if you're a guest with us, uh, let me just say a special welcome to you. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor here at Bible Christian, and we're glad to see you. Uh, Ken and myself, Ken's our connection pastor, uh, we're going to be out these doors to the right in our connect point afterwards. I'd love to be able to meet you. And I've got a small gift there we'd like to give you as well. Uh, Before we jump in this morning, I want to just let you know, we've actually had uh, this week, uh, like as Pastor Chad said, seven weeks in a row of baptisms. Uh, We had, yeah, I think we can celebrate that for sure. Um, In the first service this morning, we had uh, an 89-year-old woman accept Christ and place her faith in him, which I thought that was incredible. We should celebrate that as well. Uh, God is God is really on the move, and we're just excited to be able to partner with what he's doing and be obedient in any way we possibly can. And uh, so we're excited about that. Let's continue to fan that flame and uh, do our part and uh, be a church for the one. Uh, today, what we're going to do, we're going to jump into a couple different passages, but and I'm going to pray for us in a moment before we start. But uh, today's message, I, I want to tell you, is probably one of the most practical messages that I've ever given you. It, it may, in fact, be the most practical. Uh, we're going to talk about something that I think kind of scares a lot of people, uh, a lot of Christians, so to speak. And uh, I hope that what, what God's laid on my heart this week to give you will be something that really will be practical and be able to be played out. And hopefully it'll start tomorrow or even today when you leave here. I hope it's something you can just put right into practice. So um, with that being said, and with your hearts being open and minds being open, let's pray, and then uh, we'll jump into God's Word together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the chance to look at your Word, to allow it to uh, reprove us and refine us and shape us into better, more obedient followers of you. Father, I pray that uh, as we look at your word today, that it would, uh, it would really do a deep change in us, that it would even change our thinking this morning. And God, we just want to say thank you for the way that you're moving, for those who have accepted Christ, uh, even in the first service today. And God, I pray this morning, if there's someone here in this service, or maybe even someone joining us online that's never placed their personal faith in you, I pray that they would do it. And I pray that we would just continue to fan this flame, God, that you've started here in our midst. And uh, just continue to use us uh, here as a church in a mighty way. And uh, Lord, we do ask, as always, uh, that you would help us this morning to leave changed and not the same in Jesus' name. And God's people said... Amen. So uh, today we're going to wrap up our series titled For the One. Let's all say that statement together. You ready? Go. For for the one, for the one. And I would bet most of you, uh, the things we've been talking about over the past few weeks, uh, I I would bet that most of you are on board with what we've been talking about. I mean, I I would hope so because they are biblical things we've been talking about, uh, about being a church for the one. I think most of you in the room uh, would agree with those things. I think most of you in the room would say, you know what, I want lost people to be found and to come into a relationship with Jesus. I want our church to be a church that truly is for the one. But maybe, and this is what I would suggest to you this morning, maybe you feel a little inadequate to share Jesus with your one. Like you don't know maybe enough about the Bible or enough about the gospel, or uh, maybe you don't know exactly how to start a conversation or where to take it. And you'd say, you know, well, I'm, I'm just not really a salesman, Pastor Brian. Like I know you could probably sell like ice to Eskimos, Pastor, because you like to talk. But, but like I'm, that's not my bit. Like you, you guys have all experienced a pushy salesman before, haven't you? Maybe you were out having dinner one Friday night or one Saturday night, and you thought, hey, baby, let's go look at cars, right? And you go walk into the car dealership, and that car salesman meets you there. And, and he's got all the answers. He's got all the solutions. Every objection you throw out, he's steering you back and getting you to say yes, getting you to say yes, getting you to say yes. And before the end of the night, you end up walking out of that store and you say, you know what, I just came to look tonight and I just bought a new car, you know. 
Maybe that's been you before. Maybe it was at a furniture store and it's the same story. You're like, oh man, I just went in to kind of look around and I came out with a brand new sofa, a brand new recliner. The good salesmen really have this innate or unique ability to persuade people into action. And I think sometimes for us as Christians, when it comes to truly sharing our faith with people, we think we have to have that salesman kind of bent. We have to have that ability. I want to tell you today, you don't have to have that ability. You really don't. And I want to tell you, you don't have to leave it to the professionals, which is what most people are like. Oh, you know what? I'll just invite people to church and let pastor take care of it. Like, and I'm fi- I want you to invite people, but I want you to see today that you can do it, that you genuinely can share your faith with something that you already know, with what you already have on hand. You can share your faith. Now, the, the other thing as we think about this, just by way of introduction, is um, as you look at uh, Christians around the world, they say statistically that about 10% of Christians have the supernatural gift of evangelism, okay? What I mean by that is when Paul laid out the spiritual gifts uh, in 1 Corinthians, and there's one other place, or two other places in the New Testament, um, he lays out things like you know, the gift of hospitality or the gift of teaching, right? Or uh, he, he says the gift of evangelism, okay, sharing the gospel. Some people have a unique spiritually given supernatural gift of evangelism. But it says only about 10%, roughly, the statistically is what they say, have that. So in our midst today, only one out of every 10 of you have that gift. Now, you take that fact combined with a little bit of lack of confidence that many of us maybe have when it comes to sharing our faith, and I think sometimes we give ourselves a quick out. We give ourselves a pass. Well, you know what, I'll just leave it to the pros. I don't really have that gift. I don't really have to share my faith. Here's the thing. Jesus actually will tell us that the responsibility is actually on all of us. Whether you have that supernatural gift of evangelism or not, the responsibility is yours and is mine, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, to share your faith and reach our ones. Um, look at a really familiar passage, Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 19 and 20. This is known as the Great Commission, okay? Uh, look, look right there in the text, okay? This is, this is Jesus speaking uh, to all of his followers. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Let's read that first part of the verse together. You ready? Go. Therefore, go of all nations. Okay. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always, uh, even to the very end of the age. This was the final thing that Jesus told his followers before he ascended to heaven. If you think back through the timeline, okay, he did his earthly ministry there for a couple of years. He went to a cross and died as a sacrifice. We'll get more to that later in the message. He resurrected from the grave, spent a few days here on, on the earth, a few weeks in fact, and after that point he ascends to heaven. The last thing he tells us is this, what's known as the Great Commission. I would say Say that's something pretty important that we ought to pay attention to if it's the last thing that he leaves, leaves us with. And within that, I don't know if you noticed, but there were no passes and no excuses given in that text. Like it didn't say, therefore go and make disciples of all nations if you have the supernatural gift of evangelism. Did you guys see that in there? I didn't see that in there. It didn't say, therefore go and make disciples of all nations if you've been through discipleship training or if you've been to seminary or if you're a pastor. Those are the ones. There are no passes given when we're being given the Great Commission according to Jesus. That means we're all responsible for our part in this rescue mission. But the question is, is how is it that we, how do we do this with our one? How is it that we can start the conversation? I mean, maybe you do what we've been talking about a lot. You know, you hear me say the phrase a lot, invest and invite. Invest and invite. And what I mean by that is invest in relationships with them and invite them into either a relationship with Jesus or come to a church service here at BCC. But many of you, maybe you're like, Pastor, I've been investing and I've been investing and I've been investing. There's this neighbor, there's this coworker. I've been there for them. I like intentionally spend time on my lunch hour with that person. I listen to their issues. Like I try to be there and let them know that I care, but I'm just not sure like how to start the conversation, and I'm really not sure about like when I should cash in all my chips, okay? Uh, if you ever played poker before, I know Christians aren't supposed to play poker, right? Isn't that what they say, right? You can play poker, all right? Let, let's, if you play, ever play poker, I'm not a poker player. Like my level of like intelligence with cards is uno. That's like about my level of, of like card intelligence, so I don't play poker. But if you do, there's a point at which you at some point got to go all in, you got to go all in. Once you see you've got the right hand that you've been dealt, you've got to say, you know what, this is the time I'm going all in, and, and you're either bluffing or you really do have a great hand. Okay, that's the goal when it comes to poker. When it comes to sharing your faith, when you've been investing and investing, sometimes for weeks or months, or maybe for some of you, you're like, I've been working on this relationship with this person for years, and I'm just not really sure when to cash in my chips. I want to give you a very, 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 very simple pattern 
today, all right? And, and I'll just tell you, I, I think actually in all the years I've been around the church, and I grew up in a church, I was a pastor's kid, I don't know that I've ever heard a message this simple and this direct when it comes to how to share your faith and when to cash in your chips. But I'm going to tell you, if you will put this into practice, we will see more people accept Christ, we will see more people be baptized as we've been seeing over the past few weeks, and we will truly be a church for the one. If you guys are with me, say yes. It's incredibly simple. I promise you, and it's perfectly doable for every Christian here today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to see how to spark a spiritual conversation with our ones using one sentence, one story, and one scripture. One sentence, one story, and one scripture. Can you guys say that with me? You ready? Go. One sentence, one story, and one scripture, okay? Let's start with the first one. One sentence for the one. If you're taking notes, you can write it down in your notes. One sentence for the one. The pressure that we often feel when we're talking to people about Jesus or about to talk to people about Jesus, we're like getting worked up, we're getting psyched up about it, what, 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 how should I say this, when should I say it, what all should I say, often we feel the need to like know our Bibles cover to cover. I got to know all the facts, because Pastor, what if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer to it? Let me give you a little aside here on that one before we move any further. It is perfectly fine if someone asks you a question for you to respond with, you know, I'm not sure about that, but let me check on it and I'll get back with you. Listen, even as your pastor, I do that on occasion. Like someone comes up and is like, you know, hey, where did Cain get his wife? You know, I'm like, I don't know. I better, I better look into that. You know, that was a joke in case you're wondering. All right. But, but seriously, it's totally okay to say, you know what? I'll look into that and I'll get back with you. But often we feel this pressure. If I don't know all the answers, I, I need to be able to go from cover to cover. I need to do like the whole Romans road thing. If you've been around church for any number of years, you might've heard of that, that phrase before, that, that system to lead someone to Christ. But it's just not true. You don't need all of those pieces. One of the best ways to start a conversation with your one is by using what I'd call one sentence evangelism or one line evangelism. Not the whole Bible, not a whole paragraph, one simple sentence. Now, what, what I mean by that is this. You might want to write this down. Don't, don't miss this. What I mean by this is that anytime you're with your one, you're looking for opportunities where you can state a sentence about who God is to you and how your faith has helped you through a difficult time. Okay, I'm going to read that again, all right? When, when you're, anytime you're around your one, okay, that lost person that God's called you to reach that's in your circle that's been playing around you, you're looking for opportunities, any chance you can get to, to state a sentence about who God is to you and how your faith has helped you through a difficult time. And here is the simple start to this sentence, and you'll fill in the second half yourself. It's very, very simple, okay? Here's what I want you to say. If it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through the death of my grandfather last year. If it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through my kid and that sickness that we had to deal with last year. It was incredibly hard on me. And if it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through. If it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through that rough patch in my marriage. If it wasn't for my faith, I would never have made it through that, that bout I had with cancer a couple of years ago. If it wasn't for my faith, I wouldn't have made it through whenever I lost my job. Because you see what's What's happening here? See, as you build these relationships and you invest in your ones, they are naturally, human beings naturally share their struggles and their problems with one another. It's actually one of the wonderful gifts of being in relationship with other people. They're going to share those times, right? So you don't want to like force this, right? And you don't want to be fake with it. I I'll give you this, this little caveat here. You probably don't want to say, you know, if it weren't for my faith, if it wasn't for my faith, I, I never would have been able to forgive Tom Brady for thumping the Chiefs in the Super Bowl last year, right? Like that seems a bit fake and a bit forced when you're talking about the upcoming NFL season, guys, all right, or girls, they just don't do that. But here's the thing, if you've been a Christian for any number of years, there has to have been a time in your walk with Jesus that your faith truly did let you get through it, help you get through it, right? Like, again, if, if it hasn't, I would wonder if you know Jesus Christ personally. That would be my, that would be my suggestion to you this morning. But, but any number of years of us being a Christian, we're going to walk through these seasons where uh, if it wasn't for our faith, you wouldn't have made it through. But here's what I want you to do when you state this. You're going to start that sentence with, if it wasn't for my faith, and then after that, fill in a time that your relationship with Jesus truly helps you get through. But once you say this statement, 
What I want you to do at the end of it is I want you to put a giant period and I want you to stop talking. Okay? This, this removes all the pressure. I don't want you to put an ellipsis at the end of it. I want you to put a giant period there because you don't need to go on and give them a big theological discourse past that. What you're going to do is you're going to make that statement naturally when given the opportunity as the Holy Spirit leads you to do so about a time when your faith has affected your life and helped you get through. And then you're going to close your mouth and you're going to see how they respond. Now, it just depends on what the Holy Spirit's doing in their heart at that time. Sometimes they may shut it down completely and say, oh, I've tried that God thing before. It didn't work for me. I, I, I don't care anything about hearing about that. They may say nothing. They may change the subject. But here's what you're doing when you do this. Listen very closely. What you're doing is you're putting lures in the water, so to speak, as a fisher of men. You see, Jesus, when he, when he called his, his disciples, his followers, he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of Fishers of men, exactly. And that's exactly what this is. Have you guys ever been fishing before? Okay. I know we don't have a lot of bodies of water around here. Like, I get that. So, not, a, not like a lot of fishing here, but like maybe some. Maybe you can go to Scott Lake and do a little fishing or make your own little koi pond in the back and catch those things. You know, I don't know what you want to do. First time I ever went fishing, one of the first times I remember, uh, my dad was teaching me how to cast a line in the water. And so, I cast my line in the water and I cast my, my pole with it. You know, it just went right in there. And so, my dad got to fish out my fishing pole while we were supposed to be fishing for fish. It was pretty comical, pretty funny, uh, at least for me. Uh, but, but when you go fishing, you try different kinds of lure and different types of baits. And if you go one direction with one and try one lure or one type of bait and it doesn't work, you don't just fold up shop and go to the house. No, you change it up. You change and adjust and look for another way to lure them in. And I don't mean that in any kind of like uh, simple or, uh, or catty way at all with going after people. But if Jesus says we're supposed to be fishers of men, we ought to be looking for various ways to put lures in the water. And I'm telling you, this is such a simple way to do that. Because what you're doing when you say this, you're seeing if the Holy Spirit is at work at all in their hearts. Because everybody's not going to be ready. The Holy Spirit is not working on everybody's heart at all times. But he is working on many people's heart. Do you remember what Jesus said a couple weeks ago in our message he said he looked out at the fields he says the the, uh, the harvest is plenteous which means there are people ready to be saved people who the holy spirit has been stirring in their hearts and they're ready to place their faith in jesus and these kinds of statements simple statements can allow you to see if the holy spirit's at work and i'll tell you you'll know when he is when you make a statement like this and the next thing out of your friend's mouth your one's mouth is what do you mean by that? What do you mean your faith helps you get through it? Like, I've heard you talk about that before. I know you go to church and stuff. But like, what do, you, what do you mean if it wasn't for your faith? And when they respond in that way, that lets you know that the Holy Spirit's doing something there. Continue the conversation. And when we continue the conversation, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to move from one sentence. And then we're going to move on to one story. Everyone say one story. I want you to share one story with your one. Now, you have know, a pastor, you does like an Aesop's fable? Do I go like Dr. Seuss on him? Like, how do I do this? Do I just share the plot from my favorite Netflix show I've been watching? No, that's not, not just any story. The best story you can tell your one, when you've been peppering in those, those, those one-sentence evangelism statements, the best story you can tell is your story. Do you realize that? Your story. Your story is powerful, and it's relatable. Your story is powerful and it's relatable. You've been building a relationship with this person. At some level, they care about you. And so your story can make such a powerful difference. See, as much as I would love for you to know all the ins and outs of every scripture verse and everything in the Bible, and I'd love for you to be able to explain the great dragon in Revelation and all its implications, or like the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, it's not necessary. So your story is such a powerful tool to use in evangelism and in reaching our ones. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know all the answers. Simply share your story when given the opportunity. Turn with me over to Luke chapter 8. I want to show you an example of this. Luke 8, there's a great, great picture of this uh, here in Scripture of sharing your story. Now, as you're turning there, I'll put it on the screen, too. If you don't know where it's at, I'll put it on the screen. This is the story of the demon-possessed man, the demoniac of Gadara, okay? Uh, this guy was tormented uh, for years, okay, for years by a legion of demons. This was the same guy that they, like, chained up in the cemetery, and he would break the chains, and he would run around naked in the, in the graveyard, okay? This is where I came up with my band name, all right? Naked in the graveyard. That's our, that's our band name. Came right out of this text. I'm just kidding this morning, guys. Are y'all awake? All right, good. Naked in the graveyard, band name I'm calling it, all right? 
he was tormented for years by this legion of demons, and Jesus comes along and he casts out the demons, and the man puts his faith in Jesus. And as Jesus is leaving, the man who was demon possessed tries to go with Jesus in the boat, and this is what Jesus tells him, verse 39. He says, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and he told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. What is it that's going on here? What is it that he's telling him to tell? He hasn't heard all of Jesus' teachings and discourses. This guy hasn't been to seminary. This guy hasn't been through any kind of discipleship training. All he knows is one thing. He knows his story. He knows that he was headed in this direction, but he intersected Jesus Christ and placed his faith in him, and Jesus turned his life around and turned it upside down. He knows his story, and Jesus says, go share your story. I love what Charles Spurgeon, uh, the prince of preachers, he says this about this specific guy, about the demon-possessed man. He says, it would stick to him as long as he lived. It would be a standing sermon wherever he went. He'd be asked to tell the story of what he used to be, and how the change came about. He says, what a story for any man to tell. See, that was the story of the, the, the demon-possessed man. And see, your story, even though you may not have been possessed by a demon like the guy in the story, there was a point at which in your life, this is simply what your story is, there was a point in your life where you were living for yourself, you were God of your life, you called all the shots, you were headed in one direction doing whatever it was that pleased you, doing whatever it was you saw uh, as beneficial for yourself. But there was a point at which you were going in this direction and Jesus came into the picture. And you placed your faith in him, just like that demon-possessed man. And then you did a 180 and turned back the other direction. It completely changed your life. That's all your story is. I was here, headed this direction. I placed my faith in Jesus and he turned my life around. And that's true of you whether you were eight years old when you got saved or when you were 80 years old and got saved. Like I think I said earlier, we had an 89-year-old woman accept Christ in our first service this morning, which is amazing and like almost unheard of at that age. But you understand, every story is the same. I was living for me, whether you're 8 or 80, I placed my faith in Jesus, and this is how he's changed my life. Now this week, we were actually able to record one of our own BCCers and their story, and I thought it might be helpful if you guys heard uh, another voice in addition to my own this morning sharing their story, much like what this demon-possessed man did. Turn your eyes to the screen and check out this video. Hey, good morning. My name is Kevin, and, and I've been given this opportunity to, to share my story with you guys. So my story really begins, I grew up as a, a military kid, uh, moving around all over the place, and, and finally... Uh, Towards, towards my middle school years, later part of my middle school years, my family settled down and my dad kind of felt like he was going to be retiring soon and so uh, we didn't move around a whole lot. So I actually um, got to go to the same school for four years, um, all four years of my high school career. When I figured out that we were going to stay there, I kind of went crazy. Um, tried to meet all new friends, dated girls, did things with girls that I shouldn't have done party, drank, did drugs, like I, I just went, I just went wild, um, really just took control of my own life and, and basically said I'm gonna, I'm gonna live the best life that feels good to me right now. And that really continued all the way through my high school career, even into um, the first parts of my college career. And you know, I really didn't feel anything, there was a lot of times where, you know, I'd wake up and, and feel just this weight of why am I doing this? Um, but I really at that point had no idea that there was a better way of living and so I just kept doing it. Um, I was working at a grocery store at that point and I mean I was 19 and I was the manager of this grocery store and so that really gave me a lot of confidence in myself that, that I could do whatever I wanted to do with my life. Um, which is far from the truth but one day a guy came in and he was wearing a hunting jacket and I commented on it and I said, hey man, like that's a, that's a really cool jacket, I, I, follow, I follow that group and we had a little conversation about it and um, he actually invited me to go shed hunting with him that weekend and, and so we went out and we started, uh, started shed hunting um, and honestly it was super weird because when we met up at first at the gas station, he really didn't say much to me, he just asked me how my morning was going and, and that was it, I was just, there was, there was nothing there, there was just a little bit of small talk until we got in the truck, and at that point we were going, you know, 70, 75 miles an hour down the highway, trying to get to the spot that we were going to go hunt that day. And again, 
in this kind of whole period of time, there, there hadn't been much talk. And then all of a sudden he drops me with this question of, what's your relationship with Jesus like? And at that time I was super uncomfortable. Um, I just kind of looked out the window and, and brushed it off and, and didn't say much. Fast forward, uh, we get to the spot we're going and he reveals a lot of personal things about himself and, and in a roundabout way told me his testimony similar to what I'm doing with you guys and, and that really just like impacted me hard. Things that I didn't know were struggles or, or really even problems. Um, he revealed that there were problems and revealed that there was a better way of living life than what I had been living for the past you know four or five years. So we leave. I man for the next probably three to four weeks all I could think about was that conversation and what we had talked about out there and, and so I text him and ask him what church he was going to and I show up and it's kind of funny because I didn't realize that like church people stayed late at church but but showed up late as well so I was raised to, to get early to everything and so I showed up like 30 45 minutes early to church and the only person there was this little old lady who came up to me and acted like she had knew me my whole life I mean the way she talked to me she could have been my grandma she came up and we just started a conversation and um, then church starts and I felt what now I know was conviction. Uh, man, it felt like that. The lead pastor there was just, it almost felt like he just like been a part of my life for the last year. And the things he was, he, the things he was saying and, and what he was challenging was just very convicting to me overall and left me with a lot of questions. Um, and I asked the youth minister to go out to lunch that week and, and honestly just kind of dumped those questions on him which was the perfect opportunity for him to, to reveal who Jesus was and kind of that, over -loving love, that overwhelming love and, and grace that, that we all experience. And man, from there, it was just more questions. Another, went, another Sunday of just conviction. Um, and then another, another week of a lot of questions. And kind of after that last time that we got lunch together, I went home and, and man, I, I prayed for probably what was the first legitimate time I'd ever prayed and, and really just kind of made that decision to accept Christ there and, and just felt like this overwhelming weight, this, this burden um, had just been lifted off of me and, and what I thought was going to be a life that I would live by myself um, and maybe with a wife if I was lucky, um, suddenly was a life being lived with Jesus. Um, who you can pour those burdens onto and, and we'll carry all of them. And and that was just that was just an overwhelming relief for me. Um, so I was baptized because of that and uh, and man just, just after that continued to just try to grow in my knowledge. Um, so I just asked a lot of questions and ended up going to Manhattan Christian College for a couple years. Met some really cool guys, learned a lot there and and even was volunteering at a youth group back home uh, in Manhattan and then ended up getting the opportunity to come out here to Garden City and, and kind of intern at this church and so man I, I just feel like since um, since I made that decision to follow Jesus and, and to accept him as, as Lord into my life um, I have been given the opportunity to impact people and do some really incredible things in the same way that uh, was done to me. Um, I was the one, and if not for that youth minister, um, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, and so I feel like just as he came after me, um, now that I'm a part of the 99, I also need to, to seek my one. And that's really where I felt called to um, in my time as a Christian thus far. So yeah, that's my story. Um, man, I appreciate being given this opportunity, and, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your morning. Later. Let's celebrate that together too, church. Isn't that powerful? <laughs> See, what, what was Kevin describing there in, the, in his story? He was headed one direction, living life for self. Jesus intersected his story and he placed his faith in Jesus and what Jesus did for him. And then he turned, his, Jesus turned his life around. That's all it is. And you know the cool thing about Kevin's story, you know how much time it took him to prepare to make that video? Zero minutes. Why is that? Because it's his story. He knows his story, and you know your story. See, it doesn't take any preparation. If I were to tell you to get up here and give me a speech about Abraham Lincoln or something, some topic, you'd get nervous. You'd have to memorize it. You'd, get, you'd be all sweaty palms and knees weak and all that kind of deal, right? You would. 
But if I said, hey, tell me about the last time you went on vacation, you could spit, spit out the details of that really easily. Listen, it's the same with your story. When it comes to your story, you know the details of it. You know how that God changed your life and how he entered into your life and saved you and rescued you and changed your life. And it's a great, great way for you to reach your one. And so we begin with one sentence. Hey, if it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through and then fill in the blank. And based on how they respond to that, it gives you an opportunity to share your story, just like Kevin just shared his story. And then the last piece I want to show you today, just in our last couple minutes together, is I want to show you one scripture for the one. One scripture for the one. And let me say this before we jump into this part of it. What I'm going to do is show you one verse that will allow you to easily lead someone to Christ when they're ready to make that decision. You've you've seen if the Holy Spirit is at work and if if God is stirring in them with that one sentence evangelism. You've shared your story about what God did for you. The scripture that I'm going to give you is going to be a really easy way for you to walk through exactly what Christ is offering them by way of the gospel and how they can accept that free gift of salvation. All right? This is what we're going to do. Now, I will say this as well. It's not always this linear process, okay? It doesn't always, this is a great way to go about this, but it doesn't always go from one sentence to my story to scripture every time. Sometimes, depending on how the Holy Spirit is leading, you might end up jumping right into the scriptures. I've done that before with people as I'm leading them to Christ. It just really depends, and it takes us being sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading in these conversations that we're having for our one. But I believe if we'll be intentional and we'll keep it simple, we'll have a lot more opportunities to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. So here's what I want you to do with this last step. This is simple. There are many verses you can memorize. There are many verses you can pull thousands of them out of the scriptures that present the gospel. I think the one I'm going to give you probably presents it the most plainly and the most completely, okay? And it's Romans 6.23. I'm going to put it up on the screen above for us here. Romans 6.23 is our verse, okay? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so here's what I want you to do. You can do this over coffee with your one. You can do this sitting in your friend's uh, living room if they're like a neighbor or something like that. Like you can do this at work with a tablet. You can draw this out. This takes like first grade level art skills, all right? Your pastor has first grade level art skills. I'm going to draw a picture for you, and this could be drawn out on a napkin or a tablet or whatever you want to do, okay? One verse, okay, one scripture, and this will allow you to lead them to Christ. The way you're going to introduce this is after you've done the one sentence and you've potentially been able to share your story. What I want you to say is this. I want you to say, friend, can I share one verse from the Bible with you? Because I think if you understand this one verse, it actually will make the rest of the Bible make a lot of sense. Most of the time they're going to say yes, okay? And you can even give them this caveat. Look, if you need more time to think about what I'm going to share with you, that's fine, okay? You can take all the time that you need, but at least this way you'll have the information on hand if you'd like to make the decision to follow Jesus so that your story can be changed the way my story was. See, you can do that. You can do that. And they're going to say, okay, and so this is what you're going to do. You're going to start to write out Romans 6, 23, and you're going to write out on that napkin or on that piece of paper, you say the wages of sin is death. And Paul's there. And you say, you know, when you see death in the Bible, really what it's talking about is it's separation. Death is separation between us and God. And why is it that we're separated from God? Why is it every human being that walks this planet is separated from God? It's all because of this word right here, sin. And the easiest way, friend, that I'm sitting across coffee from, the easiest way to understand sin is by that middle letter right there in the word sin, right? And just circle it. That's what I want you to do. Circle it. I. Sin is, I have control of my life. Sin says, I call the shots in my life. Sin says, I'm on the throne of my life, and I don't need God. I don't need his authority. Another word for it is rebellion, all right? That's our sin. And because of our sin, we are separated from God. And an easy way to illustrate this for your one is to just draw it out simply. Again, this is first grade art class skills here, all right? I don't claim to have much, but I'm going to use what I've got, all right? There is a chasm between us and God. This death, this separation because of our sin basically places a chasm between us and God. We're over here on this side by ourselves, and God is over here on this side, and there is a great divide between us and him. This is what Paul's talking about here in Romans 3, or in Romans 6, okay? And you're going to say, but now the natural question, friend, as I'm sitting across coffee from you, friend you might have is, well, how do I get across that chasm? And then I want you to say, you know, some people try to do this with their works, They try to build a bridge across to God by way of their works. And they get over here and they say, you know what I do? If I do enough Hail Marys, that's one plank. And if I help a little old lady across the street, okay, that's two planks. If I help a little old lady across the street again, that's three planks. All right, if I go to church and I give money to charity and I volunteer these planks. But did you notice something about that bridge? 
it doesn't make it across, and it never can make it across. There's no way in our own efforts that we can build a bridge back to God. We need something different. It's, it, it, we can't do it. Well, that's the next part of the verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And I want you to talk to him about eternal life. What's eternal life mean? We don't, we don't got to get fancy here. We don't got to get complicated here. Eternal life is a right relationship with you being over here with God again. No longer separated by your sin. No longer under the penalty of sin, all right? This is what eternal life is. But eternal life is not something that can be earned. What did it say it is? It's a gift. And I want you to turn and I want you to look at your one. And I want you to say, hey, you ever received a gift for your birthday? If they say no, they've been surrounded by smucks their whole life. Like, like really? Everybody's going to say yes to that, all right? Yeah, you got a, you got a gift for your birthday. Did you have to earn that gift, friend, that I'm sitting across coffee from right now? No, no. Did you have to pay for that gift? No. Was there anything, any condition to that gift? Did you have to do anything for it aside from receive it? No. And you're going to tell them, that's exactly what this is. There's nothing we can do by way of our own bridge to get across to God. It is all because of a person named Jesus Christ. And that's where you're going to go next. Again, wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life, what's it say? In Christ Jesus, that's a squeaky marker, our Lord, okay? Jesus was the only one that could bring us a bridge to get us back to God. And I want you to tell them, say, it's, it's an interestingly shaped bridge, but I think you'll recognize it when you begin to see it here. That bridge looks like a cross. And Jesus was the only one worthy to go to a cross for our sins. That's what he means by the word Christ. When you see in the Bible, Jesus Christ, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Like his parents were not Mr. and Mrs. Christ, okay? Maybe you didn't know that. That's okay. Let me, give you, let me get, fill you in. Christ was a title. He was the Messiah. He was the Savior. There was nobody else that could have gone to this cross to get us back into right fellowship with God besides Jesus Christ. He was the only way to secure the eternal life that we all want, okay? Easy so far, guys. You can do this. And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, it moves us from one side of that chasm to the other side of the chasm into this new eternal relationship with God. You guys with me? And you say, you know what, in the last part of it really is pretty easy to understand too. It says, Lord. This one doesn't get talked about all the time, but when you come across by way of faith, when you come based on what Jesus did in faith to God, you're now in a partnership with God. You want to know who the senior partner is? Okay, G-O-D, he is. And see what this means, Lord, a great way to remember that is it means boss. He calls the shots. He's the authority. There's no part of your life when you come into faith with Jesus Christ in this relationship with God. There's no part of your life that's off limits to God. You're obedient in all things. He is the number one partner in that relationship, and that's what it means to be Lord. So, and so you're going to walk them through this. Again, this could be done in five minutes over a cup of coffee, writing it out on a napkin or writing it out on a tablet. And so you say, you know, we realize first that we're separated from God, realize that Jesus was the only one who could bring us back into right relationship with God by his sacrifice on the cross, and that we come to God by way of faith in Jesus, not because of our works, and we simply ask for it. We come to God by faith in Jesus, asking for it. And then all I want you to say after you finish that is this, friend that I'm sitting across coffee from, don't call them that. I'm doing that for our illustration today. I want you to say, is this something that you've done or is this something you still need to do? And see what they say. More than likely, if they're a one that God's led you to to reach, they're going to say, I've actually never done that before. I mean, I went to church a few times when I was a kid. I mean, I did the VBS circuit like everybody else does in Garden City, but like I've, that was a joke there too. Uh, but I've never placed my faith like this before. And then I want you to follow that up with a simple question. Is this something you need some more time to think about and process, or is this something you'd like to do right now? So you're giving them control of that. You're not pushing them into anything, but you're presenting it in such a way that it's clear and it's concise and it gives them the opportunity. And I'm telling you, if you'll begin to do this with your ones as the Holy Spirit leads you and as you walk through that one sentence, one story, and one scripture, we will see many, many people come to faith in Jesus Christ and do exactly what Paul said right there in Romans 6. Amen? Do you remember what Jesus said about the harvest a few weeks ago? He said, he looked out on the harvest, he said, the harvest is plentiful, 
but the laborers are few. That means there are many, many people out there ready to be saved, ready to be harvested. And it's up to us to do our part in this and have these conversations. And listen, you can do this. This is one verse, and you can do it. I know you can do it. You can come up with that one sentence. You know your story. You can share your story. And then you can also share a simple version of what the gospel is. Listen, we don't have to make this complicated, church. We don't have to, we don't have to make it weird or awkward or pressure people. This is a simple, simple way to start the process. And so here's the application for you today, and we're finished. I want you to try it. It's one thing to sit in here on Sunday and be like, man, that was really good. I agree with that, Pastor. That was simple. Yes, amen. That's awesome. I want you to try it. Listen, it may take you making those one sentence evangelism lines. It may take you making those for months before you get the opportunity to move on to your story. But start small. Start with the the one sentence, one line evangelism. If it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through that hard time in my job last year. If it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through that divorce. If it wasn't for my faith, I never would have made it through that bout with cancer. You know what your story looks like and what God's brought you through. Use that to draw others into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Try it this week. Start small. And this is how we're going to keep this in front of us. When you guys came in today, there was an impact card on every seat. Everybody grab that impact card that was in your seat and hold it up in the air. Let me see it. Everybody got one? There should be one in every seat. Okay, you can put it down. Here's how we're going to keep this in front of us. The impact card is a way for us to pray and remind us of our ones right here in Garden City. Okay? This impact card has a place on it for three names that I want you to pray and I want you to ask God what three people. And and I'll be honest, if you only have one, I'm okay with that. Start small. Put their name on here and do what the card says. It says, I'm going to pray for them daily. We're going to ask God to open up doors of conversation. We're going to ask him to soften their heart so that when we use that one line evangelism that we started with, they're open and receptive and the Holy Spirit's already been stirring. We're praying for that. Listen, if you pray for that, God will open that door. I promise you that. Then we're going to look for those opportunities to share our story with them. That's the other thing it says here. And then the other thing is, the last piece is we're going to invite them into a relationship with Jesus by way of this scripture right here, or we're going to invite them into a service or an outreach or some event we're doing here as a church. This will keep them in top of mind for you. Put it on your steering wheel, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your mirror in your bathroom, somewhere where you're going to see it every day and make the commitment to do this. Listen, a couple weeks ago we offered these and we had our early adopters take them, all right? Thank God for early adopters. We wouldn't get anything done without them, all right? Today... We've seen this is all our responsibility, all right? I don't want to see any of these things left on the seats today. I want every person to say, you know what? I'm ready to partner with what God's doing here. You're already seeing God move in such a big way here at Bible Christian. Get on board with that and ride that wave with God as he reaches people. You know, statistically, they say that every person has about 10 plus is the number they use, 10 plus people in their lives that are potential ones that God wants them to reach. Whether that's extended family or coworkers or people in your community, okay, friends, et cetera, in your neighborhood, that kind of thing, 10 plus. If you're friendly, maybe you got a few more. If you're a grump in here this morning, maybe you got one or two less, all right? 10 plus people. What I'm asking you to do is to pick three. And if you can't come up with three, I want you to pick one. And I want you to get intentional with those conversations that you're having with that person, looking for opportunities to use that one line evangelism. Listen, we will see people come to know Jesus Christ. And I've experienced a change in my life, and I know many of you in the room today who have accepted Christ have seen a change in your own life. Listen, it is our responsibility not to keep that to ourselves. Amen? To go out, to be a church for the one, and reach the lost people around us. So as we close... Can you imagine with me for a minute? Can you just maybe close your eyes and imagine with me for a minute what it would look like right here at Bible Christian if every person said, you know what, I'm taking this mission seriously. (laughs) What would it look like if not just the early adopters and a handful of other people said, yeah, that, that makes sense, Pastor, I think I'll do that. What if every single person here and every person joining us online and every person in our first service this morning said, you know what, I'm taking this seriously we would see this city turned upside down for Jesus Christ. I believe it. Do you believe that? We've got to get serious about being a church for the one, and this is how we do it. It starts simple, 
one conversation at a time. You can do it. One sentence, one story, one scripture. One sentence, one story, one scripture. Listen, you can reach your one. I believe it. If you need help along the way, come talk to me. I'd love to help you strategize about how to reach that one, whoever it is in your life. This is how we become the movement that God's called us to be as a church. We get intentional, we get serious, and this is how we become a church for the one. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the day that you sent Jesus Christ to be our personal Savior so that we could receive that free gift of salvation. Thank you that you didn't just ignore the call, ignore the need, but you stepped into the need and you were intentional in sending Jesus Christ. Thank you. God, so many lives, even under the sound of my voice this morning, have been changed forever because of Jesus. God, would you help us be the ones who bring that to the people you've planted around us? Remind us, Lord, as we finish this series, Lord, remind us that you've planted us on purpose with a purpose right where you've placed us. God, there are people ready to be saved. Fields are whitened to harvest, as Jesus told us. Oh, God, would you help us to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and sensitive to the Holy Spirit? To know those people that we need to put on our impact card and pray for and have those conversations with. And God, would you give every person here today courage to have those conversations, to come up with whatever that one sentence looks like for them and begin to use that as they try to reach their one. Father, help, I pray you'd help our people learn to share their story. And God, I pray you'd help them to commit this one scripture to memory and use it to present the gospel to the lost ones around us. Father, we love you and we thank you for opportunity to gather this morning. We ask you these things in Jesus' name.